uh, in the healthcare sector in staff, uh, pay conditions, uh, staffing levels, uh, the reasons why we're we seeing all these strikes. There will be more strikes next week. Uh, in the ambulance service, the junior doctors balloting for strikes as well, nurses and the more strikes coming up. The government uh, will be meeting with the, uh, the health unions on Monday, but it will not even then be discussing this year's pay. That is the issue that the unions uh, really want to see addressed and say it is the issue that can change this year's strikes. It's not what's being discussed here today. Today uh, is this, leading, this meeting of managers and leaders to try to find ways to sort of speed things up in the system. Indeed. OK, Damien, thanks very much for that. Damien Grammaticus there outside Downing Street ahead of that meeting. Now, look, if you want to find out how your local services are coping this, meet, this winter, you can take a look at the NHS tracker on the BBC website, bbc.co.uk forward slash news. Now, train passengers are facing yet another day of severely disrupted services as rail workers continue their second 48-hour strike of the week. It's the fifth consecutive day of industrial action by either RMT or ASLEF members. Helena Wilkinson has more. Another day and yet more disruption for rail passengers. Services across the network will once again be severely disrupted. The dispute over pay, jobs and working conditions has been going on for months. Now, train drivers, represented by the union ASLEF, have been offered a pay rise in a bid to stop the strikes. The deal includes a backdated pay rise of 4% for 2022 and a 4% increase this year. We want to get round the table and finalise. That's why we'll put this offer out with the reform that we are looking for so that we can expedite those talks and try and deliver something that will allow these strengths to finish once and for all and get our customers back with us and making sure that we protect the railway for the future. But ASLEF has told the BBC its officials haven't seen the offer yet. Last month, the RMT union rejected proposals involving the same pay offer, which was conditional on changes to working practices. On Monday, there'll be meetings between the rail minister, industry representatives and union leaders. As attempts to find a solution continue, it's passengers whose lives are being disrupted and today they're being told to only travel if absolutely necessary. Helena Wilkinson, BBC News. Now, Prince Harry is facing more criticism over his claim that he killed 25 Taliban fighters during his service as a helicopter pilot in Afghanistan. He's described the experience in his memoir, Spare. Let's talk to Zoe O'Brien. She's outside Buckingham Palace for us this morning. Uh, Zoe, morning to you. Uh, Prince Harry has been criticised by the Taliban uh, for those comments yesterday, but also, and looking at the papers this morning, several senior figures in the British military as well. Yes, well, we know that Harry has written in his memoir that he saw the 25 Taliban fighters that he killed as chess pieces to be wiped off a board. And it's those comments that really have attracted criticism. And it's fair to say there's a lot of upset and disappointment among the military community and it really is dominating as you say the headlines today we've heard from ex-colonel tim collins he's a retired commanding officer he told force news that harry's badly let down the side this isn't the kind of done thing in the army and he says you never count notches on a rifle but we've also heard from senior taliban leaders who've said they might have been the enemy but these were men with families now we know that harry writes in his book that it isn't something that he's proud of but he says it's not something he's ashamed of either now, we haven't heard anything from Kensington Palace or Buckingham Palace today. They haven't responded in any way. That, of course, is not unusual, but there is more to come. We know that Harry has taken part in a series of pre-recorded interviews. The first of those will go out at 9 o'clock tomorrow night on ITV. And that, he says, he wants reconciliation with his family, but first, truth and accountability. We know that he's also spoken to American network channels. That will go out on Monday morning. Morning. The royal family will, of course, have a decision to make then about whether or not they'll publicly respond. Thank you very much, Zoe. Zoe O'Brien there. A six-year-old boy is in custody after shooting a teacher at a school in the United States. Police were called to Richneck Elementary School in the city of Newport News in Virginia 
following what they call an altercation in the first grade classroom. The teacher, a woman in her 30s, is receiving hospital treatment for life-threatening injuries. The US Republican Party has finally succeeded to elect a Speaker to the House of Representatives after 14 failed attempts this week. Kevin McCarthy finally got the job, which is one of the most powerful positions in American politics, after winning the latest round by just five votes. The victory follows four days of Republican infighting, with a faction of hardline right-wing members refusing to back Mr McCarthy. Ukraine has accused Russia of breaking the temporary Christmas ceasefire, which its own president, Vladimir Putin, had supposedly ordered. Orthodox Christians celebrate this weekend, and our correspondent Hugo Bachega has spent the morning at a monastery in Kyiv, where Ukrainians have been gathering for their first Christmas since the invasion. Millions of people across the country are celebrating Orthodox Christmas, one of the most important days in the Ukrainian calendar. And this is an important day here at Kiev's Pechetska Lavra Monastery. This is the seat of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, which has ties to Russia. And today, for the first time in history, the Christmas service here is being led by leaders of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine, which is an independent church. We gained independence four years ago. So this this is a moment that is being uh, celebrated here as a very significant moment. Uh, some people have said that this is a Christmas miracle. Uh, some people who are here today told us that they believe this is uh, the day that is marking uh, Ukraine's independence from the Russian church. This day is obviously happening as the war continues. President Putin announced a unilateral ceasefire to allow people, in his words, to celebrate Orthodox Christmas in parts of the country where fighting is happening. Now, some Ukrainian officials say that Russian forces have continued to attack Ukrainian positions in some parts of the country, especially in the east of the country. And the Ukrainian authorities had dismissed this announcement by President Putin as cynical propaganda. But I think for those who are gathered here today, this is a moment of reflection to mark an important day, Orthodox Christmas. Concern is growing for a couple which has gone missing with a newborn baby after their car broke down on a motorway. Constance Martin and Mark Gordon left the car near Junction 4 of the M61 near Bolton on Thursday night. And Greater Manchester Police believe that Constance, has, Constance had recently given birth. Neither she nor her baby had seen medical professionals. Police are appealing for more information. Now, a man's escaped with minor injuries after he crashed and then flipped his car inside a drive through car wash in Pennsylvania in the United States. Have a look at these pictures. It was a 77-year-old driver who lost control of his vehicle and crashed through a gate after accidentally hitting the accelerator pedal. As you can see, the car flipped up onto its side. Uh, the driver was trapped inside the car for 90 minutes before being uh, extricated from the vehicle and taken to hospital. The lucky escape. 13 minutes past nine is the time. Let's take a look at the weather with Chris. Morning to you. That lovely picture is much more pleasing to the eye. What, than, than me? <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, than the dark and stormy clouds you were offering a little earlier on. I always look at the picture. I actually ignored you, Chris, as I'm going to continue to do while you give us the forecast. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. Can't argue with that. Um, yeah, you know, this morning we have got a band of rain on the way. We had a lovely start to the day in Kent, but the sky is not lasting like this. Instead, across Scotland, England and Wales, we've got this uh, rain band that's going to come through. The afternoon actually does look brighter. We're going to see a mixture of sunshine and heavy showers. Now, the satellite picture shows the area of low pressure that's bringing this band of rain across Scotland, England and Wales at the moment. Northern Ireland starting off with some brighter weather. But this speckled cloud, this shower cloud, is just waiting to come in and it will turn up pretty wet here as well. Now it's been a windy start to the day. We've had gusts of 65 miles an hour around the coasts of southwest England up over the North York Moors, filing dales up at 54 miles an hour. The strongest winds have actually been running in just ahead of this rain band which will continue to swing its way eastwards. Then comes that brighter weather with some sunshine. There will be blustery showers and there'll be a second swathe of strong winds developing late in the day across the northwest with gales developing here as well. Now temperatures on the face of it, a little bit down on what we've seen over recent days, but still mild for the time of year, 8 to 11 degrees Celsius. Now overnight tonight, the area of low pressure bringing this unsettled weather, slow moving, and it will continue to feed showers in. It will stay quite blustery and windy, and it's those strong winds that stop the temperatures from falling very fast. So it's a frost-free night, 
temperatures reaching lows of around 4 to 7 degrees Celsius. Now tomorrow, the same area of low pressure is still with us and we've still got quite a lot of isobars across the British Isles. It will be another windy day, but it is a day, broadly speaking, of sunshine and showers. Now, the showers across Northern Ireland, England and Wales shouldn't last too long because they get blown through on those gusty winds. So if you do get a downpour, the sunshine will fairly quickly return. But in Scotland, particularly for the far northwest, we're more likely to see a more persistent area of rain. And here it's going to be quite gusty as well, with gusts perhaps reaching 50 or 60 miles an hour even. And it's another relatively mild day, temperature not really changing very much day by day. 7 to 10 degrees Celsius your uh, highs for tomorrow afternoon. Now the low pressure begins to weaken and move away on Monday, but still it's a showery kind of day. Across the northwest of the UK, we'll see some more persistent outbreaks of rain. A bit of snow up over the Scottish mountains, above 600 metres elevation, so some further good news for the Scottish ski resorts here. Temperatures again about seven to 10. And then looking at the weather picture deeper into the new week, we have a lot of cloud weather systems rattling in off the Atlantic, so it stays quite windy, rain at times, and on the mild side, temperatures in London perhaps reaching as high as 14 on Tuesday. Now that's seven degrees Celsius above average, so it is going to stay mild, but pretty wet into next week. That's how things are looking. Aga, Roger, back to you. Yeah, it really is quite um, remarkable how mild it is, um, as you were saying, those temperatures for Tuesday. Chris, thanks very much. We'll speak later. It's 17 minutes past nine now, so we've been hearing the Prime Minister is uh, meeting health chiefs today to discuss ways of reducing pressure on the NHS. And one of the items which is likely to be on the agenda is how to get more patients, and we're certain that it's going to be on the agenda, how to get patients out of hospitals and into social care. Now Heidi Tomlinson has been to a care home in West Yorkshire to find out why staff there simply just can't take on more residents. Are you going to do my nails for me? Hi, I'm Joan. Good, thank you. You're welcome. It's pamper time for Joan at Home House Care Home near Bradford. She was discharged from hospital last year to live here. They're always there for you, you know. They're always speaking to you and that and having a laugh with you. Care assistant Adam is happy to help. He's been in the role for seven years. We're like best friends, aren't we, Joan? Yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> Unlike many of his colleagues, he's content with a pay rate of £10.20 an hour. I really, really find it rewarding a job to do. Um, I think other people just move on. They think grass is greener on the other side, and sometimes it's not. I think John's... And a hall is lovely. It's just above the minimum wage, which means employees often leave in search of more money. Some homes need 15 to 20% more staff to fill frontline care shifts. Well, there's room here for 68 residents, but currently 14 of these beds remain empty. Not because there's no demand, far from it. The reason is simple, shortage of staff. Which is one of the factors contributing to hospitals being under so much pressure. Patients medically fit to leave can't find care. We're expecting people on the basic minimum wage to provide a very high level of service and a very high skilled service, the amount of training that they have to undertake. And yet we expect all of that, but then we don't want to value people. And, and that's not from a provider point of view. If I could pay my staff £15 an hour, I would, but I don't get paid anything like that. Right, that's your milkshake. Let me get your tablets for you. Rates of pay for carers in the community are also low. Tony Curlew looks after David at home. Are you ready for a shower? She enjoys the work but feels £11 an hour doesn't reflect the level of responsibility. You can go to a shop assistant, go work in Aldi and you're on more money than us with so much less responsibility and stress. <clears throat> and there's, no, there's not a lot of emotional stress that you take home with you. Like we get quite a lot of, you've got to learn to not get emotionally attached to these clients. The similar jobs in the NHS are being paid significantly higher with all the benefits of a pension sick pay. Um, it's going to take a long time to get there but we've got to make steps towards it. Both Adam and Tony want to carry on looking after people but over a third of carers leave within a year. Heidi Tomlinson, BBC News. Well, the government says it's investing £15 million to increase the international recruitment of carers. 
and also launching an annual campaign to recruit carers in the UK. Statement uh, says that ministers have also made up to £7.5 billion available over the next two years to support adult social care and discharge. Let's talk to the head of the National Care Association, Nash Nadra Ahmed, who joins us now. Nadra, good morning to you. Those figures I was, we were just reading out, so £15 million to increase the international recruitment of carers, the government says it is investing. How is that being used at this moment in time? Well, at this moment in time, it's not come anywhere near the sector. Um, there are still discussions going on about how it's going to be used. Uh, and I think that's the challenge here. These, these figures are really interesting. And, and making announcements is the, the easy bit. Um, it's then getting that money into the sector and making sure it gets to the front line that's missing. So the announcements can be made, but we seldom see anything um, at, at the front at the front line. And I think that's that's the tragedy in all of this because. It gives a perception that all this money is being invested in social care. But you talk to any provider and they will tell you, well, we've not seen it. It okay. goes through various... Sorry, there's also that figure then of £7.5 billion available over the next two years to support adult social care and discharge. How should that be used if it's not being used yet? Well, I think they've got to start talking to the social care sector, both at a local and a national level. And there has got to be more synergy between the communications that local authorities and the NHS have between themselves and with the providers. Now, I know since I first raised this at the start of the year, providers telling me that they have got beds, they've got spare capacity and they've got the staff to deliver it but they're they're not getting calls from the local hospitals because the the nhs hospital discharge teams are reliant on the local authority teams and there are uh, there's a plethora of misinformation out there so we've got to get this right the communication between the nhs and the providers who could deliver needs to get much much better we spoke to Saffron Cordery, who's the Interim Chief Executive of NHS Providers. Um, you, you all know Saffron. Um, we've spoken to you both many times on this programme. And she spoke about um, changing almost the chain of command so that local authorities have more control, which kind of alludes to what you were saying. Do you agree with that kind of strategy? Well, I think, I think that's right. I think the, com the communication needs to be much better. There has to be more um, liaising between the two. Now, in some local, author uh, local authorities, there's an amazing relationship with social care providers. In others, it's a very much um, dominant lead scenario. I think what we need is to get around a table, look at the solutions. And what I want to really make clear is that social care is the solution to much of what's going on out there. If we get it right, the thing about discharge is that you can discharge people out of hospital, but you have to have a wraparound service out there in the community to support the care service as well. So if somebody needs additional mental health support, they need to have that in place quite quickly. Uh, you know, I, I've been party to information around somebody who was discharged and because it was on a Friday, there was no GP record for them. They had to still be registered um, onto the GP market. We can't have that because that puts additional pressure on the care service. So let's get the whole thing right so that we've got that infrastructure in place, we've got the wraparound service in place, and we can only do that if the NHS talks to the providers. Let's get this right um, and keep that case open for a bit so the provider can actually go back to the NHS and say, actually, this is happening, We've just ha this has happened for, not for long, for three days, for four days, so that we can start to create that confidence um, and, and sustainability of whatever methodology we, we put into place. I asked the same question to Saffron Cordery earlier, who also has not been invited to this meeting at Downing Street, which is happening at some point this morning. Um, what, I mean, you're, you've obviously not been invited. We're talking to you from Kent. Um, so what one thing do you think could come out of this meeting today? Uh, what are you optimistic about? Well, I think the, the the optimism here will be that there is a meeting, but it's got to be a meeting that has actions that can be then um, 
put into place because I think what happens is meetings for the sake of meetings, which look great, are just no good to anybody. And they've been happening for quite some time. Um, and I think, you know, Red Command and all these things are just terminologies. Let's get the right people around the table. Let's talk it through and be realistic about what we're putting out there um, as the funding so that it reaches the front line. We want to be able to pay, as you saw in that piece, we want to be able to pay our staff more. We want to be able to recruit people so that they know that they, they will be paid um, more than the, than the national living wage or whatever it might be. We cannot keep people at that rate. So it has got to be funded. It's got to be funded properly so that we can support the NHS. But actually, let's look at social care as an entity in its own right. How do we make it sustainable? How do we make this work with all the pressures that we've all got? Um, rather than just think of it as something to talk about and then go and do some, something that's already been planned. I don't like that. Let's not, let's not have a plan and then try and reach it. Let's actually have a meeting, plan, and then make it happen. Nadra Ahmed, uh, Executive Chair of the National Care Association, thank you for joining us this morning on the programme. It's 26 minutes past nine now. Um, after being captured by Russian forces and sentenced to death, Aidan Aslan's family thought that they would never see him again. He'd been defending the city of Mariupol when he was captured in April. But a prisoner exchange between Ukraine and Russia meant he was able to return to the UK in September.